everyone. Welcome to term four. I'd like to start the year off or this term off by going over the preliminary final exam that you set for the end of last term. Uh, so I'll start with the multiple choice questions and uh, we'll go on. To, this is section one and then we'll go on to section two. Uh, so let's have a look at this first question, which best describes an electrical current? Um, now, an electrical current uh, is, is a movement of electrons, but it isn't one electron moving from the negative to the positive. It's uh, actually an electromagnetic uh, impulse or a wave uh, that moves from the negative terminal via the outer electrons. So C is the correct answer here. Question two, which is the vector quantity? Mass is scalar, distance is scalar, time is scalar, and load is the correct answer here. Question three, name the diagram that shows only the forces that are acting on a structure. These Diagrams are called free body diagrams. Um, the, uh, it's the diagram that actually just shows the forces that are acting without any peripheral uh, information. Like, for example, if it's acting on a house, the forces are acting on the house. You don't show the house. You just show the forces that are acting. So it is D is the answer there. Which industrial processes reduce grain flow in metals? Now, as you know, if uh, you have a, for example, a forged bolt like this, the grain flow is the alignment of the grains to duplicate the outer surface and this is how you draw the grain flow, for example, for a bolt. Okay, so any of these processes, forging, rolling, or hammering, will produce grain flow. Uh, so the answer to that question is A. And this sand casting doesn't have grain flow. Um, casting doesn't have grain flow. Um, investment casting or shell moulding do not show grain flow. Uh, question five. Materials lists are used on orthogonal working drawings where several parts require detailing. A materials list is used on drawings, orthogonal drawings that have many components. So what details should be included in a materials list? And the answer to this one is A, you show the item number, the item description, the material type. You don't have to show the material type, uh, but that you need the number required. So uh, the date drawn is not included in a materials list. Uh, or the name of the drafts person is not included on a materials list. Um, and so that knocks that one out and check by isn't included on a materials list. Uh, the name of the company generally isn't included. Name of drafts person is out uh, and the title of the drawing is out for D. So the answer to that one is A. Next question, what is the force acting on the lever pivoting at A to produce equilibrium? Well, the way that you do this is that you say the sum of the moments about A equals zero, and it's in equilibrium, and so I generally say clockwise is positive. So you've got F, 
the perpendicular distance of the force about point A is 0 0.2, and that is going clockwise. So it's positive. And you can produce that down there and get that perpendicular distance if you wanted to use that force, or you can just break it up into components and use the component that produced the moment. Notice that the horizontal component of this force here won't produce a moment because the distance of that force is about point A is zero. So this vertical force here will be 100 sine 45. And so uh, that will, sine 45 is 0.707, so that's 70.7 newtons. I like to put it into numerical value, 70.7 newtons there. And the perpendicular distance is 0.65, and that will give you an anti-clockwise moment. And so the anti-clockwise moment is produced by this 70.7 newton force multiplied by 0 0.65. Don't know what that was. Um, and that equals 0. And the answer to this one is 230 newtons. Okay, uh, we'll go to second page here. What are the three primary bonds in materials? Um, you should know this, uh, metallic, ionic, and covalent. Um, that is a secondary bond. A dendrite is the shape of a that is produced on cooling of a metal from a nucleation point. Cubic, don't know what that is. Uh, An electric is irrelevant. Um, uh, and dendritic again, and uh, you have metallic there, which is correct, but electric is wrong. Which material cutting process is suitable for cutting glass? Now, you don't, when you're cutting glass, you don't want any heat. Uh, and a power hacksaw won't cut glass. Plasma produces heat. Laser produces heat. But water jet cutting with an abrasive in uh, is what they use to cut glass. It's, it's a suitable method for cutting glass. Question nine, uh, phi 12 hole has to be punched. Uh, this is a fairly big question for one mark, but uh, I'll just show you the solution to that. I'll get the solution up now. Um, so uh, this is what you do. Uh, normally this, this first section is just worth one mark, but You've got to do two calculations. So the first thing you've got to do is find the force required to punch a hole. And the force um, acts over the perimeter times the thickness. That's how, that's where the cutting occurs, pi d times thickness. So you find out what the force is to cut the hole, which is 37.7 kilonewtons. And then you you've got to apply that force to that diameter punch. And so you use the area as pi r squared, got to multiply by 10 to the minus six. So there's the area. I always like to work out the numerical value of the area. So you don't have to put that all down here. You just have to put a numerical value down there. And so it works out to be 333. Uh, megapascals. So I'll just go back to that uh, one, and so I'll just show you that uh, that is C there. 
water jet cutting is correct there and metallic ionic and covalent is correct there uh, which is the industrial forming process shown below that is direct extrusion um, direct extrusion is uh, here direct extrusion um, that's uh, used in preference to indirect extrusion uh, and you can see this on page if you get your red book uh, and go to page I'll find it in a minute go to page 58 and uh, you can see that <clears throat> a third of the way down you can see that uh, direct extrusion is used on ductile materials because when the ram when the ram is pushing here it's forcing the billet up against the wall of the body which increases uh, the friction and so um, direct extrusion is used on fairly ductile mater materials so if you have a look at the indirect extrusion on page 58 you'll see that the tungsten carbide die is forced into the hot billet and uh, it squeezes the billet out through a hole in the die and the ram and that's used for less ductile materials. Now question 11, what's the correct hierarchy for waste management? The important thing here is you've got to try and design out waste in any project. So uh, less waste in the design, reuse, always before recycle, takes less energy to reuse it, and then landfill. So A is the correct one there. Okay, so that's page two i'll go to page three now um, which metals cannot be hardened and tempered by heat treatment now that metal can be hardened and tempered 0.7 percent carbon um, this 0.3 uh, percent carbon can be hardened and tempered um, and anything below 0.3 very difficult to harden and temper it so uh, question 12 the answer to question 12 is this one here copper um, uh, can't be hardened by um, heat treatment and 0.1 percent carbon steel can't be hardened the only way these three materials can be hardened is by work hardening so d is the answer question 13 uh, which material is the toughest you know toughness is the area under the total area under the stress strain curve and it is c so c is the toughest here two resistors 10 ohms and 15 ohms are arranged in parallel in electrical circuit uh, there's no number here for some reason this is number 14 um, and what's the total resistance you know it's the reciprocal so it's one over R equals one over ten plus one over fifteen and that equals six ohms okay so b is the answer there a block of mass says under 15 a block of mass 10 kilograms begins to move along a horizontal surface when a horizontal force of 25 newtons is applied so here we have this block and it's subjected to a horizontal force of 25 newtons and you've got a mass of the block which is 10 kilograms so that will produce a normal reaction 
of 100 newtons and you know that the force of friction is equal to mu n so mu is equal to the force of friction over the normal which equals 25 over 100 now make sure you convert that mass to a force so a few of you didn't do that so the answer to 15 of course is 0.25 which is a uh, number four an hydraulic jack has an outlet diameter piston diameter 30 millimeters and supporting a mass of two tons what's the pressure now you know that pressure is the same as stress stress is equal to load over the cross-sectional area and that equals pressure and so we've got um, the load is 2 times 10 to the 4 newtons over pi r squared which is pi times 15 squared you don't need to put 10 to the minus 6 in there because the answer will come out as pass megapascals and that will be 88 megapascals megapascals so that's uh d uh sorry um 17 d uh, hang on it's, that's not right it is this here i didn't work that out so it's 28.3 megapascals didn't look correctly megapascals Okay, 17 is D. What features, next question, what features of a metal's structure significantly impedes dislocation movement during plastic deformation? Now, there are three things that impede dislocation movement where, uh, to cause them to tangle, which work hardens the metal. One is grain boundary, two, is other dislocations because they repel one another and three is stranger atoms produced by alloys that's why alloys are stronger than pure metals uh, <clears throat> so we've got grain boundaries other dislocations stranger atoms so a is correct i was pretty pleased to see that uh uh, quite a few of you got 17 or more with this uh, multiple choice out of 20 which uh, indicates that you've got fairly good grasp of the concepts of uh, engineering because I've tried to make these questions uh, cover the whole course that we've done so far next question is what's the main reason for providing tradespeople with dimension orthogonal drawings um, uh, to provide uh, dimensioned multiple views from which the project can be manufactured so the answer to that question is B um, and question 20 the velocity ratio for a machine when is the velocity ratio for a machine the same as a machine's mechanical advantage you know that <coughs> efficiency is um, varies the mechanical advantage only it won't vary the velocity ratio and if you want to a uh, good way of remembering that is that if you're riding a bike and you've got a rusty chain the rust on the chain is going to increase the frictional resistance but you still have to turn your legs 
you know, X number of times compared to the number of revolutions of the rear wheel. The rust isn't going to affect that. So your velocity ratio is not impaired or changed by the uh, efficiency of the machine. So uh, the answer to this is when the machine, I'll just get this pointer, uh, when the machine is 100% efficient, which obviously is impossible in our solar system. So C is the answer there. Okay, uh, so we're up to page five. <clears throat> so there are all the answers, uh, correct uh, answers to the multiple choice there. The design engineer is in charge of a team of designers who are developing a battery powered lawnmower similar to the one shown. Describe two areas of modern technology. Now, when you describe, you've got to qualify your answer. You just can't say uh, two areas. One, uh, the most, you could, couldn't say, for example, one of the most important areas in engineering is CAD. Well, you, haven't quite, you haven't described, you haven't given the characteristics and features. You've got to say because <clears throat> blah 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 okay so you've got CAD here allows for designers to share working drawings as well as parts in the assembly that have been designed by team members who may be in remote areas and so you, you can see that that's qualified the suggestion that CAD is a modern technology area the internet facilitates team uh, members, right? And here's the um, qualification there. Semiconductors and modern electronics provide hardware such as computer power, design, share, and here's the qualification here. So make sure that you give characteristics and features when you describe something. Describe two envir environmental considerations. Uh, I've got here, you must describe. In other words, qualify your statement. You you mention one environmental consideration, you'll only get half marks. You've got to qualify it. And these are the things that you could uh, mention. <clears throat> uh, if, uh, a good example of uh, qualifying um, a uh, environmental consideration is this. Um, noise intensity during mulching. You've got half a mark for that or half the marks and then you say because noise um, in an environment can blah 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 so you've got to actually qualify your statement if you're asked to describe uh, next page <clears throat> a lawnmower of mass 20 kilograms is shown below calculate the force required just lift the rear wheels off the ground. No one's going to tell you where it's going to pivot. You've got to know if you're lift, uh, just on the verge of lifting this, the rear wheels off the ground, you've got to know that it's got to pivot about the front wheels. And that's called engineering acumen. And uh, so when you take moments about R1, RL, I'm sorry, RL, uh, it's the center of mass force multiplied by 0.4. Now the center of mass, you've got 200 newtons multiplied by 0.4. It's going to go clockwise. And uh, the force acting on the handles and see what the we've done. We've made you add that to that to, that to go back to the pivot point, which is 1.2. And so you get... Um, a force of 66.7, and that was well answered. Uh, it was good to see that. I calculate the reaction forces on the front and rear wheels when the mower is stationary. When you have a look at this mower, you can see that the weight force is um, closer to RR. So you'd expect there to be more force on RR than RL. So that's a way of checking your answer. So what uh, I've done here, I've said I'm taking moments about RL, some of the moments about RL. Um, I'm taking moments about that point there because 
if I took moments about that point there, I have two unknowns in the equation. So you've got to eliminate the moment of one unknown. And the only way to do that is to take moments about that point. So you make the distance between R1 and the pivot point zero. So therefore, there won't be a moment there. So you've got RR uh, multiply 200 plus 400, which is 0.6. And that's going to go anti-clockwise. So I've got anti-clockwise down here. And then uh, don't forget this force isn't acting. That's only for the first question. And then you've got um, the weight force acting through the centre of mass, which is 200 multiplied by 0.4. And then you can get the reaction force at R. Now, if you like, you can do it this way. Uh, you know that that plus that has to equal that force there. Uh, and that's how I've done it here. But if you want to, you can just take moments about RR and you'll be able to get the reaction force RL. Okay, that first one was pretty well done. This one here, um, there was a few problems with that in the class, but make sure you can do that, particularly for the HSC here. So we're up to uh, seven. Um, this brake assembly uh, is shown. Road is made from grey cast iron. This was, wasn't was very well answered, and this is a, is a bit upsetting because this is straight out learning. Um, so. Uh, there's four marks, uh, so there'll be four aspects of the question. You've got to uh, draw and name the graphite plates, draw and name the matrix. It can be the perlite or ferrite. And you've got to actually draw the, um, the microstructure fairly well so it's easily understood. Okay, so there was uh, one mark for the name, one mark for the drawing, one mark for the name, one mark for the drawing there. If you like, you could have, if you want to do a, do a perlite matrix, you just do perlite like this because perlite's alternating bands of ferrite and cementite, you can draw that. But there's no need to um, because if you say ferrite or perlite, um, you can uh, just leave it blank because the ferrite is white. Question 22, describe two main advantages of using grey cast iron for rotors, disc braking systems. You know that the graphite plates are uh, a means of dissipating the heat uh, away from the surface of the plate because you know that brakes uh, convert kinetic energy into heat energy and it's got to dissipate the heat energy quickly. So describe, you've got to, uh, if you just mention dissipates heat effectively, uh, you only get one mark instead of two because uh, this question is worth four and here's the qualification here. Uh, noise, vibration, damping, you know, if I plates, uh, uh, stop, absorb a lot of the energy that goes through the cast iron so you don't get a great deal of noise. That's why a cast iron engine car like a, like a Commodore um, uh, is much quieter than, say, uh, a VW with an aluminium engine uh, because of the voids created by the graphite plate. You could also mention uh, easy to machine. Uh, it's got a good tensile strength, good wear resistance, and it's got excellent, uh, ex ex excellent frictional properties uh, because the brake pads actually bind into the graphite plates and uh, gives it uh, very good uh, frictional characteristics for a disc brake rotor. Okay, so we're up to eight. <clears throat> Suggest a suitable alloy for casting the brake caliper. 
it's an aluminium alloy and I was after silicon. Silicon is used um, for cast aluminium, but I would have accepted any of those. But I was after silicon. Explain why pure aluminium would not be suitable material for a brake caliper. You should know by now that uh, pure metals are much weaker than alloys because they haven't got the stranger atoms which pin dislocations. And uh, so you've got to mention that in your answer. <clears throat> um, next question. Uh, the, a lot of you got this halfway out. Look, what the idea is with this, this force board, is to use the three force rule. You know, you've got one force going down there, but one force going up there one force going there and if you by the principle of transmissibility you extend them you can get your point of concurrence there and that point of concurrence will allow you to do a force diagram of these three forces so you work out your scale and then you do a force diagram i always use bose notation so z goes between there X goes between those two forces and Y goes between those two forces. And um, so you know that uh, the mass uh, A is two kilograms. Uh, so you start with this force up here going clockwise. That force will be ZX. Go to the next force, this one here, transfer that angle up there and draw that as far as you can. And that's as far as you can go with that because you don't know the magnitude of it. But you know that this last force is parallel to that and it's got to go through Z. So that will be force YZ. So where these two meet, that'll be Y. And then you just scale off using this scale here. You scale off the size of the uh, force in this wire and the force in that wire there. And then you can get um, the uh, mass as you divide uh, uh, the force by 10, so you can convert it to mass. Uh, question. Page 10, describe two health and safety issues relevant. Here's another one, describe. If you just <clears throat> name, you'll only get half marks. You can see here that each response has to um, will be allocated one mark. So you name the uh, health and safety issue. You've got one mark, but you qualify it by putting characteristics and features and you've got your other mark there. So it's really important for you to describe correctly. Same routine here, microcircuits or integrated circuits of two have revolutionized modern electronics. You've got to describe one area and it's worth two marks. And uh, uh, so a reduction in size of the electronics and here's the qualification coming here. Okay, um, question 23, a tensile test piece failed at a load of 30 kilonewtons and had a neck diameter of 8 millimetres at diameter at failure. What's the true stress if the original diameter of the test piece was 10 millimetres? Now, you've got to know the difference between engineering stress and true stress. True stress uses the diameter at failure because when the diameter is necking, so the cross-sectional area is getting smaller and smaller, so therefore the stress is getting larger and larger. Now on a hydraulic tensile testing machine, you won't see that. You'll see the load dropping off because the cross-sectional area is getting smaller and smaller, so the load drops off. But if you've got a computerized tensile testing machine, the stress will be going up. And you can see this 
on page, if you go to the red book and go to page 39, you'll see engineering stress and uh, true stress. I see the true stress curve going up, and that's because you've got to divide it by the cross sectional area at failure. So here it is here. I, I don't set these out correctly the way I want you to set them out. I want you to set them out with a formula and then put your data down here. Then your answer goes substituted in the formula under the equal sign all the way down. And that's so that if you get a wrong answer, the markers can check all of your data here and see that you haven't made a mathematical error. Now, if you've made a mathematical error and you've made the same error in another question um, up here somewhere, you won't be double penalised. Um, you, uh, you'll be able to get full marks. But if you just um, don't put all this data down that I've asked you to, to, to do, like in this question here, I'll just show you this. See, see the data? It's been put down here. The marker can easily go and see what went wrong if you get the wrong answer here. And it's quite possible that you can get ma uh, full marks for a wrong answer. If, if you've made a mathematical error here, you've made a similar mathematical error uh, before uh, in that same question. So it's really important for you to set out these questions correctly, not like this. Okay. So that's uh, 10, I'll go to 11. And so this is the uh, pictorial drawing of the dimension orthogonal drawing that I gave you. Uh, make sure that if you're putting a circle on a face, it leans upwards to the right on this particular face here. Um, I'll just show you this. If you've got a isometric box and you've got a draw it's not an accurate box but I just want to show you you've got to draw the ellipses this isn't drawn all that well but I'm showing you that it slopes up that way and this one this ellipse slopes up that way and this one up the top here is horizontal it's important that you do that and you can see that, that one slopes up like that and this one here is um, horizontal there and uh, so it's really important for you to be able to draw these ellipses now i'll just show you a couple of um answers uh that um okay this one here received zero marks um this one here received half marks and make sure that you know that you never ever dimension an a pictorial drawing. Okay, it's really important for you to not waste time dimensioning. You only dimension an orthogonal drawing if you're asked to do it, but you never mention you never dimension a pictorial drawing. And this one derived maximum marks, even though circles uh, circles um, are a little bit out but um, uh, that derived maximum marks okay i hope that helps and uh, make sure you get your papers back off your mentor uh, to check those and uh, i'll speak to you next week bye